Hello, my name is Mike Swanson, and I run the website WallStreetWinner.com. In a few moments, I'm going to do a very special interview with Ike Iosif, who runs the website MarketViews.tv. Ike has proprietary money flow indicators that he uses to analyze what's going on with the S&P 500 and also other sectors that he follows closely, such as the mining stock sector. And we're seeing uh, interesting movements in both of these. Of course, gold uh, had a correction last month. And now, in the past few days, we're seeing you know a little bit of hesitation here in the stock market after it's been floating uh, up now for months. So, so what's, what's behind all this? What does it mean? Uh, what are the implications? These are all questions I got at Ike. So it's going to be interesting to see what his money flow indicators are telling us. But before I get to that interview, I just want to tell you that if you're randomly watching this uh, off of YouTube, you need to subscribe to my free email list. Then you'll get my uh, morning uh, email alerts, send one out just about every single day before the opening bell, my own thoughts on the market, and also the top stories of the day that I'm watching. So click the link below this video uh, to do that. And also hit the subscribe button on the YouTube channel and then the bell, and it will also uh, send you uh, the next uh, video instantly telling you about it when it's up. But you got to get on the email list. Click the link uh, to subscribe. Do both. You got to get them more closely involved with my stuff here. But now let's go and talk with Ike Iosa of MarketViews.tv. Hello, Ike. How are you doing today? Good, Mike. Thank you for having me as a guest. Oh, for sure. Um, you sent me a couple of real timely charts uh, about your money flow indicators, and I really want to uh, get into that because it's really interesting what is going on in the markets. You know, we saw gold dip, and uh, we saw um, this, the stock market's just been floating basically straight up. So, what's your? That's well. I'm going to load your charts up, and we'll take a look right at them. Well, before we talk about the charts, for the benefit of those who either don't remember or they haven't listened to us before talking about this indicator, I'll explain very briefly what it is. It is a different way of looking at up and down volume. What I'm measuring here is not the number of up shares versus the number of down shares, but the dollar value of the up volume and the dollar value of the down volume. The reason is this. If somebody buys 1,000 shares of a $1 stock and somebody sells 1,000 shares of a $1,000 stock, the net result on the cumulative volume is going to be zero, plus 1,000 shares minus 1,000 shares. However, one transaction is worth $1,000, the other transaction is worth a million dollars. So to me, the $1 million transaction ought to have bigger weight than the $1,000 transaction. So the black line here represents the dollar value of the up volume in the S&P as a percentage of the total volume. The red line is the dollar value of the down value in the S&P as a percentage of the total S&P daily value. Okay? The 50% level is the equilibrium level. If this is the level where the two are equal, and that is where we have equilibrium in terms of price. Now, when the dollar value of the volume is rising, that is supportive of higher prices. In the past, we have seen important turning points, either when these two indicators are at equilibrium, because at that point we either get a negative crossover, or um, at oversold and overbought levels. 
Like, for example, look at how oversold the market had gotten in March of 2000, okay, and we got a reversal. Now, again, uh, look how we got an upside reversal every time the uh, this indicator got to the equilibrium level since the rally that started last year. What is interesting to me is right now we are back at the equilibrium level. So from here, two things can happen. Either inflows will start to increase or they will go negative. One of the things this indicator allowed us to do is by using the method of extrapolation and utilizing the rate of change in price, we can calculate what kind of movement we will, we will get if this indicator went back up to overbought or oversold levels, okay? Now, if from this current level, we have an upside reversal, that was inflows begin to rise again, to go back up to the overbought level, which is near the 60%, that can support anywhere between a 7 to 10% move on the upside. By the same token, if we get a negative reversal, in other words, the outflows exceed the 50%. In order to get to the oversold territory, we can also have, it will take about a 7 10% move on the downside. And the reason why I think we're at the pivotal level right now is because this indicator is saying that a 7 to 10% move over the next two months is highly possible. And it is happening with the S&P at the top of its rising channel that has been in effect since 2009, which is chart number two. Well, you know, not, I'm not going to, when I say this, I'm not making a prediction, but if the S&P were to go up another 10%, I mean, it's like floating up now. I mean, the way it looks to me, it's breaking. It's at the top of this channel in your second chart. It's at the top of the channel. If it were to break, if it was to go up another 10%, the cyclically adjusted P would, I think, be above where it was in, in 99, 2000 for the S&P 500. It'd be the highest valuation ever in the history of the, of the U.S. stock market. Well, if you look at this chart, okay, we can see that since 2009, we have had actually uh, five incidents that the S&P had gotten up to that, uh, up to the top of the channel. One was in 2010, the other one was in 2011, and both these times they made contact and then we had a, a rather large pullback. The same thing happened at the beginning of 2018, okay? There was another time, another incident, that as you can see from 2014 to early 2015, the S&P just kept going up. Ah, just, like just, riding it. Yes, it, it, kept, exactly, it kept riding the upper end of the channel. So from the last five incidents, okay, in three out of those five, the S&P made a quick contact and then a sharp pullback. And then we have one incident that for a year and a half, we just kept riding, you know, underneath that. It kept rising underneath that uh, upper end of the channel. So statistically speaking, more than likely um, from here, we could get a sharp pullback. And if you combine this with the fact that cash flows are at the equilibrium, which is the point where either we get a reversal to the upside or um, uh, the flows turn negative, it would seem to me that it's not absolutely certain, but the odds do favor that over the next two months, the next 7 to 10 percent move more than likely will be to the downside. Now, could we keep riding yeah, it happened before. 
Can we get the breakout? Uh, yeah, anything is possible. But what we're talking about here is what is most probable. And I think given the position of the S&P and where cash flows are right now, more than likely the next 70% move will be on the downside. Now, if that was to happen, we also know something else, that we should see sign of it within the next one to two weeks. Okay. After two, three weeks, if the S&P keeps riding along that upper end of the channel, then we could, we could be in an environment like what we had between 2014 and 2015. But that should become clear within the next you know, few weeks. On the other hand, if we get a, uh, a negative crossover here in, the, in uh, the cash flows indicator, then it is quite probable we will get a 7-10% decline. So we'll have to watch real carefully how things evolve, let's say, the next, no, the one, next two, couple of weeks, huh? Yeah, I agree. And, and it, you know, the end of this month will be earnings season. Um, there's been times in past years, uh, uh, July 2015, uh, where, you know, the market has made pivot points. Uh, but yeah. So, the, the, yeah, the point coming out of these two charts is that the S&P is at a pivot portal level. The chart says that. The cash flows say the same thing. So people, yeah, I think it should you know pay attention because uh, yes, there is a uh, possible. Well, I'm going to keep my eyes glued to what enfolds your indicators, and you do updates on MarketViews.tv. People should subscribe uh, to, to, to you know to get them. We only talk uh, every once in a while, uh, but. You also have them for the XAU, which is a gold stock index. Yeah, which is also at the pivotal point. And here's the reason why. When we look at the same indicator, what do we see? It got up to the oversold territory levels that usually mark an upside reversal if the XAU is, is within a bull cycle. Okay, if we were to get a rise up to 65%, 70% in this indicator, that would mean more than likely that we got a thrust to the downside, and that changes the picture. Right now, okay, it is, the point, it is at the point where we should get a bounce. And in fact, we have gotten one the last few days. If you look at the next two charts, one is XAU on the left, the other one is gold. What do we see with regard to the XAU? It had a sharp pullback, but it's above support. That is what usually happens when this indicator gets oversold. The XAU does not violate support if it is still in a bull cycle. So going forward over the next one or two weeks, if the XAU is still in a bull cycle, we should see um, the cash flows are beginning to get less oversold, begin to come down from oversold territory. I'm sorry, that is what I should have said. And second, the bounce of the last few days should continue higher and actually carry the XAU above 160. That would be confirmation that what happened last month was just a sharp pullback within a bull cycle. On the other hand, if the XAU continues lower over the next one to three weeks and break support at 130, which means at the same time cash flows would have gotten up to the 65-70% uh, territory, 
then that would change the picture because it would mean that the decline we had last month wasn't a sharp pullback within a bull trend, but an initiation to the downside. And we will have to go back to see how things are a month from now. If we look at the chart on the right, which is gold, we can pretty much see the same thing, okay? Um, we have support at 1700. It held above that support. If it continues higher, it should get above 1900. On the other hand, if the cash flows for the XAU go up to the negative cash flows, go up to the 65, 70% area, that again would be an initiation to the downside, a thrust to the downside. And in that case, let's say XAU will break 130, gold will break 1700. And to go, you know, as low as 1600, and from there we have to reevaluate. But the, the important thing, the significant thing is this. This indicator is at the level from where we get substantial rallies if the XAU is still in a bull cycle. And if the cycle, if the cycle has changed, then what we will see is a further deterioration in the negative cash flows. We will see this, I mean, the red line rising up to the 65, 70%, okay? So this indicator is also telling us something very important, very significant, that we are at the point where we will get a confirmation that the bull cycle is still on or that the bull cycle is off at least for the next three to six months. Well, I wouldn't, personally, I wouldn't be shocked if gold, I mean, it's around 1800 at today as we're, as we're doing this. I wouldn't be shocked if it just fell to 1760 or 70, I mean, uh, 1770 or, you know, just dipped a little bit and then went back up and possibly, you know, starts doing more positive with the indicators. I agree. It wouldn't surprise me either. But the key thing is for that 1700, 1750 mm, right. uh, to hold. Right, and right, the right. Flows, the negative cash flows not to exceed the 60% you know, percent level, not to go much higher than where they are now. In, in a way, the more negative scenario, I, I, I think, would actually be, I mean, gold's around 1800. If it were to go to 1830 and then go, <laughs> go break, you know, have a bounce to 1830 from here, and then you know, dove below 1750, that would be pretty scary. I, I, I would think that kind of action would cause your indicators to give these signals. Oh, yeah, I agree. I agree. And again, the key thing out of these, you know, three charts is what I said also about the S&P. The XAU and gold are at key levels. Cash flows are at key levels. And people uh, who care about gold and, and, and mine stocks should be very should pay very should pay attention to what happens over the next one to three weeks because it could determine the direction of both gold and mining stocks for the next three to six months for sure well uh hopefully we'll catch up again uh sooner next time uh than we have this time yeah, i really appreciate the time you're taking to show this to to all of us and uh, uh, suggest everyone go to marketviews.tv and, and subscribe what can they get if they do that well they get the interviews that I do with about 20 different other colleagues of ours and also they get my own analysis which I post uh, every uh, every weekend every Wednesday and once a month Well, thank you, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Mike. Have a good day. Okay.